This is a story from God's Word, from Genesis to Exodus. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when God created humanity and placed them on the earth, he intended to live in fellowship with them. But they were not satisfied, chose to disobey, and lost their place because of that sin. Human sin and wickedness continued to increase until God resolved to destroy the world with a flood, saving only Noah, who was righteous, and his family, and God started over. God chose Abraham to make for himself a covenant people, a people of his very own, to whom he could reveal his power and teach his ways. They were to be a blessed nation through whom all the world would be blessed. God told Abram to leave his homeland and go to the land that he would show him. And there, his descendants, as numerous as the stars of the sky or the sands of the sea, would possess that land. But he also told Abram, they will be strangers in a country, not their own, enslaved for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that they serve, and I will bring them out to worship me here at this mountain. Abraham was the father of Isaac, the son of the covenant. Isaac was the father of Esau and Jacob. God renewed his covenant with Jacob and renamed him Israel. Israel had 12 sons. The two youngest of his beloved Rachel were his favorite. But Israel's favoritism over Joseph led to jealousy among his brothers to the point that they plotted to kill him. In the end, they sold him as a slave to some traders headed to Egypt. But God was with Joseph everywhere he went, and he rose from being a slave to managing all of the household of Potiphar, captain of the guard for Pharaoh, until a false accusation left him, put him in prison. But even there, he was soon put in charge of all of the prisoners. Two prisoners had dreams. And Joseph was able to correctly interpret those dreams so that two years later when Pharaoh had troubling dreams that no one could interpret, Joseph was called up from prison to interpret the dreams. And he explained to Pharaoh that there would be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine so severe that all of the prosperity of the first years would be forgotten. And as he proposed a plan to store up grain against that end, Pharaoh put him in charge of that plan and made him second in command in Egypt. It happened as Joseph predicted, and the famine spread even into Canaan where Israel and his family lived, and they were struggling to find food. So Israel sent his sons to Egypt to buy grain. When they came before Joseph, they did not recognize him because he spoke and acted and dressed as an Egyptian, but he recognized them. And after a series of tests, he realized their hearts had changed and he revealed himself to them, forgave them, and invited them to li come to live in the land of Goshen next to Egypt where he could provide for them. And so they came, Israel and his descendants, 70 in all. Years passed, Israel died, Joseph died, Pharaoh died, and a new Pharaoh, whom the scripture says did not remember Joseph, came into power. And when he saw how the Israelites had prospered and multiplied in number, he began to fear that they would one day rise up and fight against Egypt. So he set taskmasters over them and treated them harshly causing them to work in his fields and to build, make bricks for his many buildings. He also told the midwives to kill the baby boys, but fearing God, they did not. So he commanded that all Israelite baby boys be thrown into the Nile. Moses was born during this Nile edict, and his mother hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she took a basket 
covered it with tar, placed the baby in it, and put it in the Nile with his sister Miriam to watch over it. That day, Pharaoh's daughter came down to the Nile to bathe. She heard the crying baby, drew him up out of the water, and had compassion on him. Miriam offered her own mother as a nursemaid, but when Moses was wounded, he was given to Pharaoh and raised as her daughter in Pharaoh's palace. When Moses was grown, he went out one day to see the work, the Israelites at their work, and he saw an Egyptian beating an Israelite. And seeing no one around, he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. The next day he went out and he saw two Israelites fighting. And he said to them, you are brothers, why are you fighting? And one said to him, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian yesterday? And then Moses realized his murder was known, so he fled from Egypt into the land of wilderness of Midian where he married and became a shepherd for 40 years. One day while he was out with the flock near Mount Horab, he saw a bush that was on fire but not burning up, and he went over to investigate. And a voice spoke from the bush saying, Take off your shoes, you are on holy ground. And then God introduced himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he told Moses, I am sending you back to Egypt to bring my people out, for I have indeed heard the misery of their cries. Moses resisted and made excuses, but God answered them all. He appointed his brother Aaron as spokesperson, and he equipped Moses to do miraculous signs before Pharaoh. And so Aaron and Moses went back to Egypt. And they went before Pharaoh, and their message to him was, This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Let my people go. Well, Pharaoh had no interest in losing his task force. So, in fact, he even made life worse for the Israelites. So God sent a series of ten plagues upon Egypt. First, the waters of the Nile turned to blood so the people could not drink. Then frogs came up from the land and filled their homes. Gnats swarmed the land. Flies filled their houses. At this point, whenever Pharaoh would start to relent a little bit and Moses would pray and the, Pharaoh, and the plague would be gone, then Pharaoh's heart would be hardened again. And so the plagues continued on Egypt but not now on, on Goshen. <clears throat> there was a plague on the livestock, festering boils on humans and pe- the animals, hailstorm that destroyed their crops, locust who ate everything that was left, and darkness that covered Egypt for three days. By now, even Pharaoh's officials begged him to let the people go, but he stubbornly refused. So God sent the final plague, death of the firstborn. Moses told him every firstborn male in all of Egypt, from the lowest slave to Pharaoh's own son, even of the cattle, would die. But God made a provision for the Israelites They were to take a male goat or lamb, one year old and without defect, kill the lamb and use the blood and put the blood over the top and the sides of the doorpost of their homes. And then they were to roast the lamb, eat it with unleavened bread, with their sandals on their feet, staff in their hand, ready to go. And at midnight on the 14th day of the month, every firstborn male in Egypt died. But for those who had the blood on the door of their house, death passed over that house. And the Egyptians wailed in their grief and they begged the Israelites to leave, giving them gold and silver and clothing as they left. And so they left 600,000 men with their wives and all their children in droves of flocks and herds. And God led them out as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night until they camped between Migdal and the Red Sea. 
After the Egyptians had buried their dead and Pharaoh realized what he'd lost, he gathered 600 of his best chariots and all of the officers and chariots of Egypt, and he pursued the Israelites. And when they saw him coming, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. But God said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff over the waters so that they will divide and the people can walk across on dry land. And I will gain glory over Pharaoh and his army. And Egypt will know that I am the Lord. And the pillar of fire moved from in front of the Israelites and situated itself between the Israelites and Pharaoh's army, light on their side, dark on Pharaoh's side. And all that night, God caused a strong east wind to blow and the waters piled up on the right and piled up on the left. And the Israelites walked across on dry land. And when they had fully crossed over, God looked down from the pillar and he caused confusion in Pharaoh's army as they pursued the Israelites. And as they entered the Red Sea, God said to Moses, put out your hand again. And when he did so, the waters returned to their place and all of Pharaoh and his army were drowned. Not one survived. And on that day, God delivered the Israelites from the people of Egypt and the people feared the Lord. Well, happy Easter. It's good to see all of you. So glad you're here. I know what many of you are thinking, whether you're in the building or joining us online. You're thinking, man, that was awesome. But what's that have to do with Easter? I'm so glad you asked. <clears throat> you know, that story ends with Exodus chapter 14, verse 30, where it says, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hands of the Egyptians. And for the authors of the Bible, that day where God delivered them from Egypt simply became known as the day. The day. And they'll use the vocabulary of the day to talk about the moment where God confronts evil on a huge level, when he brings rescue to the enslaved and where he establishes his people. And as you go through the Bible and you get towards the end of the Old Testament, these guys come along who are known as the prophets and they begin to speak and they begin to say, there's another day coming. What God did before on the day, he's going to do again. Can you say he's going to do it again? Are you out there this morning? Are you glad he's risen this morning? He's going to do it again. There's another day coming. But this time, it's not going to just be that God's delivering one people group, Israel, out of Egypt. It's going to be something much bigger than that. Can I talk to you all about Egypt for one second? Because a lot of times we read our Bible, we hear these stories, and we think we're just, the, the Bible's just trying to give us a geography lesson or something. But Egypt for the Israelites is, they have a different concept of Egypt than it just being a country or a place to visit or a nice vacation spot. Egypt for them represents something. And we see this first in Genesis chapter 37 where Joseph is being sold into, his, into slavery by his brothers. And I want you to notice what the slavers go to Egypt to trade. It says, then they sat down to eat, being his brothers, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to where? Egypt. Now notice, they do not go to Egypt to trade in food. They do not go to Egypt to trade in treasure. The Bible wants you to get this. These traders trade in the instruments of death. That is what you use to bury somebody. 
These traders go to Egypt to trade in the instruments of death and burial to embalm people. And we know about Egyptians. They're the ones who mastered mummification, right? And they built great monuments, not to the living, but for the dead. And see, in the mind of the Israelite, in the mind of the biblical author, the Egyptians, they are the masters of death. We know ancient people, when they thought about the realm of the dead and the land of the dead, they envisioned it as being separated apart by the waters. Maybe you've studied Greek mythology before. Maybe you've seen the Disney movie Hercules. Either way, you will know that to, in the mind of the ancient Greeks, to get to Hades, you have to go past the river Styx. This is how ancient people think of the land of the dead. And so the Bible is very clear that in Exodus chapter 2, it tells you Israel is bordered by the Nile River on one side, and on the other, it is bordered by the sea. The picture you need to get is this is the land of the dead that is, uh, that is surrounded by the waters of death. Sometimes we wonder, why did they need to cross the Red Sea? Couldn't they get around it? That's not what the story is trying to tell you. It's trying to tell you, remember, the waters of death hold you in to the land of death. How y'all doing? All of the biblical vocabulary about Egypt always says you go down to Egypt. Doesn't matter where you're coming from, you go down to Egypt. Just as you go down to the grave, so you always go down to Egypt. And the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, ends by telling us that Joseph, this son, full of promise, full of hope, full of God's purpose, he dies in Egypt, the land of the dead. He dies there, and he's put in a coffin there, and he stays there. See, what I want you to get this morning is that the events of the Exodus we just heard and the events of Easter they have a reminder in them that every human being faces the same great problem, that is death. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, good or bad. It doesn't matter if you're African or Asian or Caucasian or Hispanic, male or female, educated or dumb. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. You can be Buddhist or Jewish or everything in between. All of our strivings, all of our seeking after comfort, uh, the music and the entertainment that we get so attached to to kind of numb out the noise of life, our seeking after luxury and accumulating stuff, our chasing after attractiveness, in health, the assurances we think we get when our group is in political power, the assurances we think we get from our financial investments. Listen, all of our hopes, all of our dreams, all of our aspirations, they all ultimately fade and fail in front of the great enemy that is death. Listen, science isn't going to fix it. Medicine will never surpass the technological advances in warfare and weaponry. History will tell you that. And we see in our world, there is still this violent impulse within, inside the human heart. And there is still cruel inhumanity that goes on. We see that now in a world that has a world filled with war. And we have come through or hopefully getting close to coming through a pandemic. But what it reminded us of is many of us have suffered loss. We have suffered despair. We've come face to face with our frailty. And all of that just serves as a reminder that the threat of death overshadows 
everybody. I know you thought you were coming to church today to hear a nice fluffy message, and you were going to leave feeling really good. I must, I just have to assume this is your first time at New Wine Church, so I want to welcome you. But I do have to apologize to one person in the room this morning, not for that, but I, I need to apologize to my mom because I'm wearing a leather jacket on Easter. I don't have my Easter pastels on today, and so mom, I'm sorry. But you know, Easter's not just about the flowers and the eggs and the pastels and the sunshine. I don't know why you think you're here today. Maybe you're thinking I'm just here uh, because this is what my family does on Easter. Maybe you're sitting there thinking I'm here because my grandma dragged me here, because my mom dragged me here, because my spouse dragged me here. But I want you to know the reason we are here today and the reason Christians have gathered on this day for centuries is because every human being before and that will ever come goes down into the place of death and stays there. But today we remember there was one. There is one who came and he looked death face to face and he said, death, you have held everyone else down. Nothing and no one has ever overcome you. But today is what? The day. Today is the day. The prophets saw it coming. Today is the day. And we remember that there is one named Jesus who went down into death, but he did not stay there. As the Bible says, he arose and he came out of the grave and he said, I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and the grave. And here is the great hope of the scripture that anybody who grabs on to Jesus and clings on to him for dear life, they can also say, death, you have no hold on me. As the apostle Paul writes, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? I now belong to the king of life. And so I got to wear my Easter leather today. It really is. You may not be thinking it, but it is my Easter best because I hope that maybe this will be a little reminder to you that Easter isn't just about being pretty. In fact, there's some things about Easter that got pretty messy, that got pretty dark, that got pretty bloody. But see, the God I serve, he doesn't look at the things that are oppressing me and enslaving me. He doesn't look at those things and think to himself, oh, I hope he figures it out. I hope he finds seven steps, 10 steps, 12 steps to get himself out. The God I serve isn't polite to the things that are killing me. Easter needs to remind us that the God we serve looked down from heaven. He said, they're not going to make it. Death's going to have the final say in their life. And then he came down. He didn't stay far away. He didn't leave us. He came down. He said, I'm going to get beaten. I'm going to get bruised. I'm going to get bloodied. I'm going to get tortured. I'm going to be crucified. And I'm going to die for them. The God we serve is the God that he doesn't leave us and watch from a distance. He's the God who fights for us. You've been fighting for your marriage. You've been fighting for your kids. Some of you have been fighting for your future. You feel like you're fighting for your life. You need to know on Easter, we remember the God who fights for us. Amen. Maybe you should give him a little bit of praise this morning for who he is. Thank you, Lord. You know, this story, it's not just about the land of Egypt that represents the realm of the dead, but there's also a king over the land of the dead. The Bible calls him Pharaoh. But God has something to say to this king of the dead, the Lord of the dead, doesn't he? He says, let my people go. Let my people go. And what does Pharaoh say? He says, no. These are my people. They serve me. They belong to my kingdom the kingdom of death. And so Pharaoh invites the God who fights for us to fight. And we see God brings the hammer. He sends 10 plagues on the land of Egypt, plague after plague 
after plague, we get to the ninth plague. Exodus chapter 10 tells us that on the, when the ninth plague arrived, darkness covered the land of Egypt. Because you all know, darkness comes right before the day. And <clears throat> it's no coincidence then that in Luke chapter 23, as Jesus replays this Exodus moment and he follows the pattern of the Exodus in Luke chapter 23 verse 44 as he hangs on the cross it says it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land the ninth is back and then the final plague that comes upon Egypt <clears throat> is the plague where the firstborn of every household dies, but God says if you take the blood of a spotless lamb and you put it over your doorpost, then death will have no hold on your household. And more than that, you will exit out of the land of the dead into the land of the living. But notice the exit door is the door that has the blood of the lamb over it. My exit out of death into the land of the living is through the blood of the lamb. And so Jesus comes, and interestingly, he is both. He is first the firstborn, but this time it is God's own firstborn. And he is going to take death into himself. He is going to die our death. But he also proclaims himself to be the lamb, that through his blood that is shed, now that is our exit, the doorway out of the land of death into new life. And so the Bible says in Luke chapter 23 that the firstborn son and the Lamb of God dies. In verse 46, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Look at what the account in the Gospel of Matthew tells us, that when he had breathed his last breath, at that moment when he gave up his life, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. I got to say, this is one of my favorite parts of the story. This is one of my favorite parts of the events of the day because this is where God starts tearing stuff. This is where God starts ripping stuff. This is where God starts splitting stuff. It doesn't matter if it's a sea that's holding me in Egypt. He's going to part it. It doesn't matter if it's a veil in the temple that is keeping me separated from his presence and his love. He's going to tear it. It doesn't matter if it's a lie in my mind I believe about myself, somebody said about me, something that happened in my past. God's going to shred it up. And it doesn't even matter if it's a rock that's trying to hold me in the tomb. God's going to split it and open it up. Amen. <clears throat> and so... Jesus is laid in that tomb. What's interesting about the Exodus story is Pharaoh's symbol of power is the great waters that surround his nation. Yet he is defeated in his own water. Pharaoh, the king of death, is defeated in the waters of death. And what Jesus is going to do is, if I can put it this way, He's going to defeat death in its own water. He's going to defeat death by dying. And so he goes into the tomb. He defeats death itself by dying. But we know we're here today because he isn't going to stay there. He is in one place. He is in death but he is not going to stay in death. He's leaving. He's exiting. He's going to have an exodus from death to life. And the scripture tells us that Jesus, because Jesus gives us this pattern of exiting, of leaving where you're at and going somewhere else, that when we follow him, we follow that pattern. And so we are in this place the Bible calls the old. That's your old existence. That's your old way of living. But guess what? With Jesus, you exit. You have an exodus. You're here, 
And now you come in to the new, a new existence, a new way of living. The Bible tells us the place we are in is a place of darkness. We all have things in our life that are in darkness. But guess what? As we follow Jesus, we also follow his pattern of I'm not staying where I'm at. Through Jesus, I was in darkness, but now I'm in his light. And ultimately, the great hope is I am in this world that is tainted and overshadowed by death. But as I follow Jesus, I know I am not staying here. I am leaving this place that I am in, and I am stepping in to his life. And here's what I want you to know. Jesus didn't just step in to life as he had had it before, because that life is still overshadowed by death, and the life we're living now is still overshadowed by death. But when Jesus came out of the tomb, he got the upgrade to life 2.0, the life that has no death in it anymore. Life 2.0, we live in life 1.0 right now, but know the place you are going if you follow Jesus is not just a replay of this, it is something different. It is a completely new reality and existence of life. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that there is another day. Can you believe it? There's another day. There is a day when the firstborn son, the Lamb of God, will return. And John writes in his book, Revelation, he sees that day and he says this, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more what? There will be no more. There will be no more. And there will be no more. All of these things are gone forever. That's the day that every follower of Jesus now looks forward to. And if you're here today, I just feel like God may be saying to you, Today is the day. Today is the day for you. Maybe you've got and you recognize, I have a Pharaoh in my life. I have a bad habit. I have that thing that happened to me in my past. And you know it's got you enslaved. And you've been fighting. And you've been fighting. And you've been fighting. But hopefully today has shown you There's a God who's fighting for you. There's a God who's saying to those things, let my people go. You may be here and you've just come face to face with your human condition, with your frailty. You're welcome. I hope you've been reminded that we all have this great enemy in our life and you may be here thinking, you know, Death would have the final say in my life right now. And if that's you, the great news of Jesus is that you don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to be certain about everything. You just have to say, I've heard this story and I know enough. I understand enough. I've heard enough to commit to him. I don't have to have it all sorted out. I don't have to know everything I believe. I just need, all you got to know is Jesus I'm committing to you. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it's going to be like. But I don't want death to have the final say in my life. I'm going to belong to the king of life. Would you all stand with me this morning? We're going to pray together. And at the end of this prayer, I want us to I'll tell us the time to repeat after me, and we're going to say a prayer all together of just trust in Jesus and praise for Jesus. But I want to pray for you this morning for those who, who feel trapped and enslaved. No, God's going to get you free. He's fighting for you, and he is going to get you free. 
please don't expect it to be pretty and comfortable. It might get kind of ugly and get kind of rough. That's what the cross tells us. But he's going to get you free. And for those of you who maybe this morning are making the decision, I need to, I got to step into this new life of Jesus. I know death has a hold on me. It's got the final say in my life. I've got to go with Jesus. And if you believe that, the Bible says, you just tell him, tell the world, I'm following Jesus. I'm going with this story. I've been living my own story. I've been living my own thoughts. I've been living my own life. It hasn't worked out that great. I'm going to go with Jesus' story. I'm going to go with the way Jesus thinks about things. I'm going to go with Jesus' life. So, Father, I thank you for the work you're doing in this place, Lord. We praise you, Jesus, that you didn't stay in death, but you arose and you came out with the authority over death and over the grave. We thank you, Lord, that we are just frail humans, but you gave your life so that we can live. And we will resurrect and follow you, Jesus. We thank you so much for your resurrection power. God, I pray for the people in here who are numb to everything, who aren't feeling anything this morning, Lord, because they got so much trauma in their life. They have so many things in their past. God, set them free in the name of Jesus. The price has been paid. The battle's been fought for their freedom. Bring freedom, Lord. I pray for the marriages that are struggling. I pray for the kids that are wandering, God. I pray for the bodies that are sick. The battle has been fought. We already have the victory. We praise our God who fights for us. And if we can just all repeat after me and say this prayer together. Jesus, we trust you. And we follow you. We believe you died on the cross and you rose from the dead. And we will rise from the dead. Amen. Amen. It's good for all of us to recommit put our trust in Jesus. But if you said that prayer for the first time this morning and you believed it in your heart and you're putting your trust in Jesus, um, myself and the prayer team will be down here. We'd love to connect with you. This is not a journey that you do on your own. You do it with the people of God. So we won't keep you very long. But if you said that prayer for the first time, be sure to come down and join us after we sing this final song. Are you guys ready? to worship the King who is risen, the King who has set us free, the King who has brought us through the new exodus. Let's sing and worship Him together.